I'm gonna share with you today the greatest crash in all of racing history that I think not only changed racing, but also changed the way the European nations saw each other. It was the 1955 Le Mans race in France. And in this crash, a Mercedes ended up going flying into the stands and it killed 84 people and injured 180 other people. And of course killed the driver as well. And neither before nor since have that many people died in any race car crash. What were the conditions that led up to this? There's a few. One was there have been no safety upgrades in this track or even reconstruction since like 1927. Back then in 1927, the race cars topped out at like 60 miles an hour. These cars were now doing 170 miles an hour. And when I mean they had not no safety features at all, there were no pit walls. The spectators were just off the racetrack like the stands were. And they had like little earth mounds next to it, but it was almost nothing. If anything, that was a ramp if you hit it to get you to hit more of the stands. These different manufacturers were very comfortable with the racers dying. It was kind of something talked about openly. Um, Enzo Ferrari is quoted as saying that in the crashes, he gets angry that he's lost a car. He can always get another driver. You know, there was, there was this kind of sense of these countries fighting each other. 1955, 10 years after World War II. I think there was this mindset that these were soldiers and they were still fighting. And there was that kind of intense rivalry. Safety wasn't a part of the 1940s for them. It was all about, you know, protection and dealing with your neighbors in a very specific way. And these are the same people. This is 10 years later. It's, you know, it's 2023 now. Imagine 2013, the states next to you, you were fighting to the death, right? And now you're on a racetrack. So in this accident, 84 spectators died. 180 were injured. 160 people were killed in the Oklahoma City bombing. And what you have to understand is that they played through. They finished the race after this. What happened was the new Jaguar D-Type, which was competing ferociously against the Mercedes, braked hard to go into the pit. And they had the disc brakes as most cars did. And as I mentioned, the Mercedes had drum brakes to save weight. As the Jaguar broke suddenly, there was an Alfa Romeo right behind it that swerved and the Mercedes also swerved because there was no way they were gonna stop in time. And that's when the accident happened. They simply went off the straightaway, hit the embankment, went flying into the stands. The car tumbled about 250 feet through the stands, hitting spectators, coming apart. It then struck a cement barrier and the description is it exploded. It just totally disintegrated, everything came apart. And that's when the gas tank set fire. The gas tank burned hot enough to set fire to the ultra lightweight magnesium body. When magnesium metal catches fire, it burns so hot, it can melt other metals. And the worst part is they ran over and threw water on it is what the rescue workers did. Unknowing that when you throw water on magnesium or even knowing that that was a magnesium chassis, it burns even hotter and explodes. So they had a fire they couldn't put out. They had over 80 dead people. There were bodies that had been thrown into the track and were smoldering. And they were, you can see in the film, they're pulling down advertisers' banners off of the walls to cover the bodies as they're pulling them off the track. The hood ended up flying like a Frisbee and actually decapitated people. So you can imagine the scene is unbelievable. It looks like a bomb was dropped. I mean, things are on fire, bodies are thrown, people are cut into pieces, it looks like it was bombed. What occurred next is the race was stopped for a little bit and then they restarted it. They decided to play through on this. That shows the mindset, right? So here was England and Germany fighting in France. Basically, a bomb has been dropped and we're gonna play through to, you know, to see who wins. It's very familiar and from 10 years ago was actually occurring, but on a different, for different reasons. But some strange kind of echoes of it are being seen. Mercedes not only pulled out of the race, they canceled their racing program and did not race again until 1987. That's how long they stayed out of racing after that. As a way to show respect, taking responsibility, and wanting to be a big part of cars being, you know, a responsible fitting in element in society. Jaguar, what did they do? They didn't even leave the race. They finished the race. Having caused the accident, they finished the race. And the driver is seen smiling in the pits, drinking champagne, 
And there's a photograph of that in a French newspaper the next day. And the quote under it says, to your health. So I, what I think is so interesting about this is it really, for automotive racing, I think there's a before and after. Because when this occurred, all racing stopped around the world. America shut down racing. Europe shut down racing for one year. Everybody kind of took a moment to regroup. What are we doing? Because the statistics of death for drivers weren't that far off from fighter pilots during certain parts of the war. I mean, these individuals were wearing what looked like the kind of uniform you'd wear to go golfing. Their helmets were really almost about the thickness of a baseball cap. And they didn't wear seatbelts because they preferred to be thrown from these cars rather than be a part of the ball when it you know, gets all mushed up. I imagine some of it has to do just because it looks better at the funeral, you're dead either way. So there was this, I think, moment of like, wait a minute, why are we killing ourselves? Why are we doing this? Why are we still in that mindset? Racing was kind of reborn, I would say, at that point. And, and basically 1957 came back with new institutions that regulated it, new regulations. You see the birth of, the whole, of all those companies now that make safety gear for racing. A lot of them have their origins around that time. And the same thing was done in America. And in America, drag racing was huge. And the National Hot Rod Association was actually born really to protect drag racing because it was seen as kind of an outlaw dangerous thing kids did on back roads. And the idea was, let's make a place where they can do it in different towns. They did a big showcase that they would take going around all of America, showing towns how you could do safe drag racing. I think it was really interesting and it really preserved motorsports having that big unfortunate event happened. I think without it, there would have been this really long going accumulation of horrendous statistics each year of deaths of spectators and drivers for probably another decade or more before it really, there was probably a moment of awakening of, wait a minute, you know, why are we doing this? But having so much lumped in the one moment, I think really made, you know, an amazing difference. There's another element that's interesting is the racing that even today or recently didn't take that cue. And you kind of have to wonder if a little bit of that is our natural sense of wanting gladiators in society, right? Because if you take a look at a lot of rally racing, the spectators are right up next to the cars. And the only time you've seen rally racing really reel it themselves back is with, with Group B in the 1980s. Group B was basically considered to be too crazy to continue because they were finding fingers and body parts in like air vents and cars, you know, spectators reaching out to tuck the, touch the cars, mechanics who are doing pit stop work, you know, getting banged up. The cars were pretty much far beyond what a driver could handle. That was the only time Rally ever rolled it back. But I think that beyond that, the only other one that's left that seems to want to satisfy our bloodlust for gladiator warfare is the Isle of Man TT, right? Isle of Man TT is a race through an island near Scotland. That race has been going for over 100 years. It's a motorcycle race on open roads. It's about, I think, like 13 miles where motorcycle riders are doing 200 miles an hour through streets next to buildings, near cliffs, near cement walls, stone walls. The average death rate, fatality rate, is one and a half per year for 100 years. That means that any year, basically, you don't have a death. Expect two or three to stay on average, you know, the next two or three years. Effectively, when you go there and you look around at the pits, at the racers, if you were to look at all of them, there's probably one or two that'll be dead by the end of the weekend. It's the only race left that I think kind of carries that element. It's kind of interesting when you think about human nature, you know, and, and our basic instincts to, uh, for sport and combat. When you get a ticket, it might look something like this, but the first thing that you need to do is take a picture of that ticket and send it to 305 305. That will get the ticket clinic on your case immediately. They've got brick and mortar offices in Georgia, Florida, and California, but they can help you find a ticket no matter where you get it in the United States by helping you find a local attorney that will do everything they can to help you avoid costly fines, insurance premium increases, points on your license, risk of suspension, even jail time. They've helped me out with this ticket and many others and a lot of my friends as well. So check them out now at the link in the description below or again, text your ticket it to 305-305 to get the ticket clinic on your case. They are the perfect partner in your fight against any speeding ticket.